child killed every 10 minutes in Gaza on average. European Union seeking to re-engage with China. Good afternoon, Salam Malaysia Madani. I'm Jessica Lee, and you're watching World Today. Now, World Health Organization said a child is killed averagely every 10 minutes in the Gaza Strip. Warning: nowhere and no one is safe. Its Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus told the United Nations Security Council that half of Gaza's 36 hospitals and two thirds of its primary health care centres were not functioning, and those that were operating were way beyond their capacities describing the healthcare system as being on its knees. Hospital corridors crammed with the injured, the sick, the dying, morgues overflowing, surgery without anesthesia, tens of thousands of displaced people sheltering at hospitals, Families crammed into overcrowded schools, desperate for food and water. Gebreyesus recalled growing up during war in Ethiopia, saying he understood what the children of Gaza must be going through. The sound of gunfire and shells whistling through the air. The smell of smoke after they struck. Tracer bullets in the night sky, the fear, the pain, the loss. These things have stayed with me throughout my life. Since the 7th of October, the WHO has verified more than 250 attacks on healthcare in Gaza and the West Bank, while there had been 25 attacks on healthcare in Israel. Now, Israel says Hamas hides weapons in tunnels under hospitals, charges Hamas denies. Deputy U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Robert Wood said the United States is working to try and get fuel to hospitals in Gaza, stressing that civilian and humanitarian facilities must be respected and protected under international law. The Security Council stood for a moment of silence at the start of the meeting to remember civilians killed in Israel and Gaza, along with 101 people working with the UN Palestinian Refugee Agency, or UNRWA. Meantime, footage released by the Palestinian Red Crescent showed medical teams in Gaza City's Al-Quds Hospital worked on patients under torchlight. The video showed staff inside the hospital treating patients in complete darkness, aside from few torches being held above the injured and dead. Reuters confirmed the location and the date visuals were taken with the Palestine Red Crescent Society's spokesperson, Nebal Ferksa. The Palestinian Red Crescent said one person was killed and 20 Eight others were wounded in a shooting by Israeli forces at Al Quds Hospital in Gaza. The majority of the injured were children, and two are in critical condition as a result of sniper fire targeting the hospital. A Palestinian envoy on Friday criticized Western states for supporting Ukraine by calling out Russia's violations of international law while stopping short in atrocities committed by Israel against Palestinians in Gaza. Palestinian ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva, Ibrahim Karaishi, was speaking alongside more than 40 ambassadors to observe a minute of silence for thousands of civilian deaths in Gaza since the start of Israeli bombardments more than a month ago. Kiraishi cited European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen's remarks last year that Russia's attacks on civilian infrastructure, including electricity in Ukraine, were war crimes. In Gaza, where electricity has been cut off since the 11th of October as part of Israel's tightened siege and more than 11,000 civilians have died, Western leaders, including those from the European Union, have tended to use softer language and continually reiterated that Israel has a right to defend itself. 
Now, Israel has shamelessly claimed that it abides by international humanitarian law at all times and instead accused Hamas for the civilian deaths, saying it uses people as human shields. Now, most of the ambassadors who took part in the minute's silence on stage were from the West Asia, Asian and African countries. Now, no Western countries joined, although the Dutch ambassador stood on the sidelines. Malaysia does not want the meeting of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, or OIC, on Palestine to just conclude with a statement of condemnation without presenting any concrete steps to move forward. Now, Foreign Minister Datuk Sri Dr. Zambria Bukadil stressed that there is a need for affirmation from OIC member countries so that the ceasefire is expedited and the killing is currently happening in Palestine to stop. Hosted by Crown Prince and Prime Minister of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, the 8th OIC Emergency Summit will take place in Riyadh to discuss the Israeli regime's ongoing attacks, brutality and inhumanity on Palestinians. Masyarakat pertemuan demi pertemuan, tetapi dia tidak memberikan impak apa-apa, tidak menghasilkan apa-apa. Perlu ada penegasan, perlu ada langkah-langkah ke hadapan daripada negara-negara anggota untuk menyegerakan proses ceasefire untuk segera dihentikan penama serangan-serangan dan pembunuhan-pembunuhan kejam yang dilakukan oleh rejim yang tidak berperi kemanusiaan ini dan begitu juga kita turut berbincang tentang apakah langkah-langkah susul Prime Minister Datuk Sri Anwar Ibrahim is expected to arrive in Riyadh today to attend the meeting or the emergency summit where he will voice the firm stance of Malaysia on the Palestinian issue that has plagued the country for a long time. According to the Foreign Minister, the OIC emergency summit today will be preceded by the Arab Nations Summit, which will take place simultaneously. A joint statement will be issued at the end of the two summits, which is expected to have a big impact. Malaysia's second shipment of humanitarian aid for Palestinians through Ops Esan departed for Al Arish International Airport, Egypt, via a special chartered cargo flight last night. Now, the cargo plane carrying 20 tons of medical supplies and baby goods took off at about 11 p.m. from the cargo terminal of Kuala Lumpur International Airport, KLIA. The first shipment involving goods weighing 20 tons was made on the 2nd of November. The shipments were part of 50 tons of goods totaling more than 7 million ringgit collected through Ops Isan. The remaining 10 tons of goods are expected to be delivered soon. Once the aid arrives in Egypt, it will be handed over to the Egyptian Red Crescent Society, acting as a partner to bring them into Gaza through the Rafa border. Deputy Prime Minister Datuk Sri Fadila Yusof, who witnessed the sending off, expressed his appreciation to to the people of Malaysia, non-governmental organizations, NGOs, airlines and logistics personnel who made the humanitarian aid mission a success. Meanwhile, he said Malaysia is ready to send more rubber gloves to the medical teams in the Gaza Strip. Mengumpul uh, 100 ribu dan kita masih memeluk, uh, me, uh, apa, menanti pengesahan berapakah jumlah yang uh, sebenarnya diperlukan. Yang sekarang ini yang akan uh, sudah pun kita serahkan pada KLN, uh, sumbangan dari badan majlis uh, rubber council lah, uh, sebanyak 100 ribu sarung getah tangan. Uh, dan uh, kita juga uh, uh, sudah berhubung dengan syarikat-syarikat pengeluar kalau diperlukan, mereka akan standby untuk menyediakan. Ops Esen is an initiative launched by the Foreign Ministry together with more than 50 NGOs. The European Union is seeking to re-engage with China ahead of a major summit on the 7th and the 8th of December following high-level meetings in Beijing that touched on a range of thorny Topics. Now, European Commissioner for the Internal Market, Thierry Breton, described his meetings with Chinese counterparts as constructive and tense on some issues, but added 
that it was very good to re-engage after the challenging pandemic period. Breton said that the world's largest single market, which he represents, was preparing to participate in a summit with the world's second largest economy, China, in Beijing next month. It was for me the opportunity um, to uh, rebalance our relationship, to uh, de-risk our economies and societies and express, for, in fact, what I wanted to propose to rebalance our relationship, to de-risk our economies and societies, and also to um, address global challenges together. The EU market chief's visit to Beijing comes on the heels of a diplomatic blitz in recent months by top Brussels officials. The bloc's foreign policy leader, Josep Borrell, said in Beijing last month that trust had been eroded between the EU and China due to various disputes involving trade and geopolitics. In September, EU Trade Commissioner Valdis Dombrovskis visited Beijing following values and transparency chief Vera Jourova's visit earlier in the month. FBI agents seized electronic devices from New York City Mayor Eric Adams earlier this week, now days after a raid on the home of his chief campaigner fundraiser. Now, federal authorities are conducting an investigation into whether his 2021 mayoral campaign conspired with the Brooklyn Construction Company and the Turkish government to funnel foreign money into the campaign through a straw donor scheme. The FBI declined to comment on Friday's reports that his electronic devices had been seized. It was reported that the devices seized from the mayor, at least two cell phones and an iPad, were returned within a matter of days. FBI agents had searched the home of Adams' chief election campaign fundraiser, Brianna Suggs, on the 2nd of November, and she was questioned by public corruption investigators. Now, law enforcement officials have investigated several other associates of Adams in recent in months. In July, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg announced the indictment of six people he said had used a straw donor scheme to illegally generate public matching funds for Adams' 2021 election campaign. All six men have pleaded not guilty. Now, Adams, who was not accused of any wrongdoing in the indictments, has said he and his campaign team had no knowledge of or involvement in the alleged scheme. Now, flooding has hit dozens of towns in northern France, leaving roads sometimes only passable in boats and dozens of schools closed. Now, two rivers, the R and the Liane, were placed on red alert for flooding in the northern Pas de Calais department after heavy showers overnight from Monday to Tuesday. Interior Minister Gerald Darmanin said on X that seven people were injured but did not provide further details. He said that more than 1,500 firefighters were mobilised in the region. Now, coming on the heels of Storm Sierra, which battered Western Europe last week, the floods impacted around 60 municipalities, causing significant damage, with dozens of schools closed. Local authorities were reinforcing dikes in some towns and pumping water into the Calais Canal to alleviate floods on the R River. Visit Cruz, the official river flooding watchdog, described Tuesday's floods as exceptional. Environment Minister Christophe Béchou said dozens of towns would be considered in a situation of natural disaster, which makes it easier for those whose homes or businesses were flooded to benefit from insurance coverage. The red alert warning will remain in place until until Wednesday evening. European Space Agency or ESA Chief Josef Ashbacher on Friday warned that the melting of polar ice caps and glaciers is very critical and called on political leaders to recognize the importance of climate change. Now, according to the World Meteorological Organization, for the first time ever, Global temperatures are now more likely than not to breach 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming within the next five years. 
Ash Becker in August urged wavering politicians not to abandon European leadership in combating climate change, saying record heat waves and vegetation fires provide really alarming evidence of the pace of global warming. The situation at the poles is very critical. Uh, we have, uh, of course, we see with our satellites uh, day and night uh, what, uh, uh, how, how big the, the melting of the polar regions is, uh, but also what is the impact on sea level rise. Uh, we have some of the most accurate uh, satellites, ma satellite measurements to see how the sea level, uh, sea level is rising due to melting of uh, polar regions, glaciers and so on. Ash Basha was speaking on the sidelines of the One Planet Polar Summit, a summit on the situation in the poles attended by political leaders and researchers from 40 polar and glacial nations in Paris. Sports, Benzema hits hat-trick for Al Itihad following coach departure. Rakyat Malaysia memang hebat kerana tegas pertahankan hak Palestin. Memang kita jauh. Kita jauh dari dunia Arab. Kita jauh dari dunia Palestin. Kita jauh dari Gaza tetapi setiap detik yang berlaku menyentuh hati nurani kita kenapa apa? kerana kita tahu dan faham arti manusiawi arti ihsan arti kemanusiaan dan lebih penting arti keadilan melawan kezaliman Israel Welcome back. We kick off with news on the Saudi Pro League. Karim Benzema recorded a hat-trick to lead Al Ittihad to a 4-2 win over Abha in the club's first match since title-winning coach Nuno Espirito Santo was fired. Now, the defending Saudi Pro League champs sacked Santo earlier this week after going five matches without a win and a reported locker room argument with Benzema. Benzema moved to Saudi Arabia after leaving Real Madrid this past summer, over the scoring by converting a 38th-minute penalty at Prince Abdullah Al Faisal Stadium. The 35-year-old also supplied the assist for Brazilian Igor Coronado to put the home side back in front after Kartoko Ikambi had level for Abhar. Now there was plenty more to come from the former France international as he scored twice in as many minutes midway through the second half to make the win safe for Al Ittihad. Now both goals came from clinical finishes after Benzema was put one-on-one -on -one with the opposition goalkeeper following quick breakaways. Fahad bin Jumaya scored a late constellation goal to make the result a little more respectable for the overmatch up her. Now the victory takes them up to fifth in the Saudi Pro League standings, 11 points behind leaders Al Hilal after 13 games. Meanwhile, league leaders Al Hilal continue their winning streak with a 2 0 shutout of surprising Ta'awun yesterday night in Riyadh. Al Hilal mostly controlled the tightly played match, outshooting Ta'awun 14 8, but couldn't find a way past Brazilian goalkeeper Milson until two late second half strikes gave them their 11th win of the season. Now, after having a first half goal waved off, Serbian striker Alexander Mitrovic finally broke open the match in the 81st minute when he headed home a free kick from midfielder Malcolm. Al Hilal's Mohamed Kanu then added an insurance goal nine minutes into injury time to put the game out of reach for Ta'awun. The win gave Al Hilal 35 points on the season and extended their lead over second place Al Nasser to seven points while Ta'awun remains in fourth place on 25 points. Let's move on to tennis. World number one Novak Djokovic swatted down any speculation he might be looking to coach ATP Finals rival Holger Rune any time in the near future as the top eight players in the world converge on Turin for the year-ending tournament. 
When asked whether he will consider coaching the Dane once his own career come to an end, the 36-year-old said he plans to continue to play as long as he is competing at a high level. Look, uh, I, I don't know. It, it seems a very, very far uh, thought for now. Um, I, I do love tennis, you know, of course. I do love competing, do love playing. At the moment, I'm still playing very high level of tennis. And as long as that's the case, you know, I'm going to still keep on competing. Uh, motivation is still there, you know, to be, to be uh, traveling and to be playing at the biggest events in the sport. So. Djokovic beat Runa 7-5-6-7-6-4 on the 3rd of November in the quarterfinals of the Paris Masters, which he went on to win. Now Djokovic, the number one seed in Turin, and Runa, the number eight seed, are both in the green group for the round-robin stage of the tournament, along with home favourite and number four seed Yannick Sinner and number six seed Stefano Tsitsipas. Now while in Turin, Djokovic also took time to hit some balls with number two seed Carlos Alcaraz, who heads up the red group along with the number three seed Daniel Medvedev, fourth seed Andrei Rublev, and seventh seed Alexander Zverev. In other news, former world number one Naomi Osaka will return to the WTA Tour after a break of 15 months at the Brisbane International Warm-Up for the Australian Open in January. The four times Grand Slam winner last played the WTA tournament at the Pan Pacific Open in Tokyo in late September 2022 and had a daughter shy in July this year. The 26-year-old who won the Australian Open in 2019 and 2021 has had long spells out of the game since her second triumph at Melbourne Park, taking a lengthy break to prioritise her mental health after skipping the 2021 French Open and another after the US Open the same year. The Brisbane tournament, which is returning after a three-year hiatus forced initially by the COVID pandemic, will also feature Andy Murray and another twice Australian Open champion in Victoria Azarenka from the 31st of December to the 7th of January, while the Australian Open takes place at Melbourne Park from the 14th to the 28th of January. Dazzling, intriguing stories and more coming to you in our Offbeat segment. The largest internally flawless, fancy, vivid blue diamond ever put up for auction sold for a staggering $43.8 million at a Christie's sale of rare jewels in Geneva this week. Now, the vivid blue diamond, known as Blue Royal and set in a ring, is among the rarest ever to be unearthed. At 17.6 carats, the diamond had an estimated value of up to $15 million prior to the sale. It's been in the same family collection for over 40 years. It's the first time it's ever appeared for sale at auction. It had a really deep, saturated, rich blue colour and also was an unmodified pear brilliant shape. So it really ticked all the boxes, which is why we managed to excite collectors all around the world, all the way from the Far East also to America. So no, we're extremely delighted with the result. At the auction, Christie sold dozens of rare jewellery pieces worth a combined total of more than $77 million. In a separate sale on Monday, Christie sold a Rolex wristwatch worn by Marlon Brando in the 1979 movie Apocalypse Now for more than 4.5 million Swiss francs. The actor had engraved his signature on the back to avoid having it swapped accidentally during shooting. by Napoleon Bonaparte during his reign at the helm of the French Empire is expected to fetch 800,000 euros when it goes on sale at an auction in Paris at the end of November. The black beaver felt hat in traditional bicorn shape was a trademark of the emperor which came to symbolize Napoleon's historical character. It was worn 
on the tail that is with the corns parallel to the shoulders as opposed to most of his officers. The bicorn hat together with the frock coat forged the myth of the soldier emperor. The model that will be auctioned by Osenat Auction House in Fontainebleau is adorned with a cockade that Napoleon fixed to his hat in 1815 during the crossing of the Mediterranean from his exile in Elba to Antibes from where he led a brief return to power. The bicorn will go on sale on the 19th of November together with a nightshirt that the Emperor wore on his final exile on the islands of St. Helena and a copy of his last will written out by the Count of Montolon at Napoleon's dictation. Italy's Ministry of Culture said they recovered tens of thousands of ancient coins, possibly from a 4th century shipwreck off the coast of Arzacchina in Sardinia. According to a press release from the ministry, the recovered treasure would amount to between 30,000 and 50,000 bronze pieces in an exceptional and rare state of preservation. A local amateur diver spotted the coins in shallow waters and alerted the local authorities. The mystery added that the bronze coins dated from the first half of the 4th century AD and said the treasure trove was far bigger than the cash found in 2013 in the United Kingdom, when 22,888 similar coins were discovered near the site of a Roman fort in the southwest county of Devon. Life-size models of a woolly mammoth, an African savannah elephant and dwarf elephants are on display at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. The secret world of elephants reveals how elephants heal with their feet, how their ears cool their bodies and elephants how they use their trunks for practically anything yes, and everything. Process. They make all kinds of vocalizations, but they can also emit what are called infrasound communications. It's called infrasound because it's below the register. The exhibit is going to be at the museum for the better part of a year and a half. They're actually transmitted through the ground. So it, it, it's a whole fascinating thing that nobody would ever have imagined, really. What we're trying to do is Introduce elephants. Bolivian devotees headed to the La Paz Cemetery to celebrate their own Day of Dead by having Natita skulls blessed. Now known as Day of Skulls, La Paz Cemetery was filled with Natitas decorated with flowers, sunglasses, hats and smoking cigars or enjoying Bolivian iconic coca leaves. This tradition, a fusion of Catholic and Indigenous beliefs, is so often practiced by some of the country's Indigenous groups. The friends and families at La Paz's Municipal Cemetery decorated the skulls with a diversity of objects during their visit. Traditions and cultures of the Aymara, Quechua and other groups remain strong in Bolivia, where indigenous people are a majority in a country set in the heart of South America. And with that, we reach the end of our bulletin. In our top story, one child killed every 10 minutes in Gaza. Join us again this evening at 8.30 p.m. on TV1 and Salaran Brita RTM for more news. I'm Jessica Lee. Thank you for watching.